many of you may know that I'm a part of uh, the um, uh, Project Build team, and Lynn has done a presentation for us there that I was impressed with, and I thought that it would be a good thing for her to come and share her uh, knowledge about, uh, especially uh, the hardwoods of the Northwest or the the, uh, the woods of the Northwest and the things that Sustainable Northwest Woods does. And um, uh, I think it's a real valuable resource for us. And I, I think all of us are always looking for ways that we can be we obviously work with a product that's renewable, but we're looking for uh, uh, ways to uh, use our, our products su sustainably. And uh, the, the, right in the title of the company is uh, sustainable. And so I was, um, I was, I thought I really liked this idea. Um, when I was back in Columbus, we had a, uh, uh, there was a company that did something very similar um, but I really like the idea of sustainability. And if you go to Sustainable Northwest Woods, you'll see uh, they have, it's a, it, I mean, it's sort of a fantastic lumber yard and uh, uh, um, I, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and so I asked Lynn to do this and she uh, agreed. Uh, you'll, I think you'll find her uh, very uh, uh, well organized and ready to go. And uh, I think it looks like you're muted, Lynn, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. And uh, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about your background and, and, and then, you know, uh, go on with uh, uh, your presentation. I see, I'm just looking at your background. I love to do this when, I, when we have Zooms, is looking at what people have in their background. And it looks like you've got uh, a bunch of uh, pictures of wood and pieces of wood. So. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a wood geek for sure. Yeah. And I, I love to collect sticks and weird pieces of uh, fall off and things like that. I have little pieces of bark on all the windowsills. And yeah, I'm just kind of fascinated by all the things organic about wood. And I so appreciate you having me back um, and that you enjoyed the presentation at Project Build. Um, and I just really admire um, the Guild and all the things that you guys do. And it's always a treat to get to see the individual members come down to our shop. If you haven't been to Sustainable Northwest Wood before, I would encourage you to come down and I'll give you a shop tour, show you um, a lot of the different things that we'll talk about tonight. And then you can kind of dive deep and um, come pick out some wood for your projects. And I'm uh, really grateful for the opportunity to speak to your full group here tonight. And hopefully if you've seen this before, it won't be um, too boring and you can feel free to plug in some questions in the chat and then we can have a, a little open ended question and answer session at the end if you would like um and That's perfect. Uh, yeah yeah and so um if you listen to me talk for very long you'll realize that i'm not from southeast portland even though i live and work here <laughs> um, i grew up in kentucky and um, my my family owned some small wooded areas and we used to you know selectively harvest some logs and, and send those to the mill one of my first apartments was within earshot of a little sawmill in eastern kentucky and um and so I've kind of grown up with this in my DNA. My, my dad's a woodworker and a carpenter. And so like, you know, the smell of sawdust really speaks to my memories. And, and I love working here because of that. There's all those great aromas of wood around the shop. And I mix that up with a little K&F coffee in, in the back of our shop. And it's, yeah, it's a little uh, sensory uh, delight. So what I'm going to do, let me see here, let me, I'm gonna share my screen and I'll kind of just jump into our, our presentation, tell you a little that bit more great. about us. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and we've set it up so you can, I hope, have we? I yes. surely have. Yep, okay, cool, great. And She's good, she can do it. Yep, yeah, okay. <laughs> you have such faith in me. I've yeah, all right. All right. Now, can you see my full screen? Okay. Uh, we see screen. that, and we see uh, the next slide. We so we, you've got, got the present. You need to swap displays, right? Yeah. Slideshow, come on, do it. Well, it should work. Huh? I always have to do this like first, and then come back to okay. it. Okay. Why it doesn't let me do it when I'm on Zoom? Can also try hitting F five. And see if that doesn't pull it up. 
you know, you're using a PC, I see, so. Yeah. So annoying. Did this the last presentation I had too, and it was really frustrating. It took me a couple of minutes to figure it out. Well, you know, the I find about technology is, is that it's more the most most likely to fail when you need. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so. All right. Um, yeah, we're still not. Yeah, it's showing me. It's usually a tiny little icon, like when you're in. The yeah, down on the bottom of the screen. The bottom, Clicking it, it's not letting me in there. So um, let's see, let's try this. Lynn, are you, trying, are you trying to share your screen? Yeah, sharing my screen, but also I'm trying to enlarge the um, presentation so it's in slide on view. That, on that pull down where you have to go to presentation view show. And PowerPoint and then share that whole screen. And then swap swap displays because right now you have it in two display modes so one is your slides and one is the other one so yes. you, you just need to swap the two displays so there's usually a little icon that says like swap down on the right next to those there's like three little icons down on the bottom and one of those has a menu that says swap displays right now you're not sharing your screen with us oh goodness all right hold on mm -hmm. share your screen and we can help you <laughs> yeah I think well, you had it where it said uh, uh, slideshow. You click on resume slideshow, and it should pop it right up. She she was in pre, we she was sharing presentation the presenter side, so we yeah. just need to get her to swap. Yeah, gosh, you guys, yeah. I'm so sorry. Hold on. That's okay. You know, we've all done it. How do you think we're doing? The, how do you think we're doing this? <laughs> I know. All yeah, right. I just did it's in a presentation in front of 100 people again. yesterday. So. <laughs> Okay, bingo. Are we there? We're getting right. close. We're looking close at the, enough. Yeah. yeah, it's we're, like we're I don't know. We're gonna do it. Okay. <sighs> now try yeah. the F five. Yeah. Actually, it's one of those weird little icons there that's under there. See those little? Uh, it's I think it's the third, fourth one over that shows the two different displays. You see that? You know, there's there's the one magnifying glass and the one next to it. No. Go, go back to your resume slideshow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go back to resume slideshow. Yep, you're, you're stopped sharing your. All right, I don't know why it's doing that. All right. Bingo, oh. there we, okay. Now you're actually. So now you have that, all right. Yeah, yeah now we go to your PowerPoint. Hold on. Close the whole thing out. That's okay. Because we, we're actually just seeing your, your desktop now. So okay. That's good. That yeah, it's it's it. good. Yeah. You get to see how you organize your life. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, right. Uh, it's yeah. all it's all the things. Mm-hmm. And of course, this will take a moment to load now yeah, that I closed yeah. it out. Yeah, it's okay. Well, you guys are awesome. Thanks for your patience. I really appreciate yeah. that. That oh. makes me feel much better that mm -hmm. you're just a patient and kind group well, and nobody's anybody who's ever done a presentation. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who's done a presentation knows how this goes. Um, bingo. All right. Yeah. So there is slideshow go for that yeah i don't know why it won't give me the full screen though when i do that it's doing this mm -hmm. so yeah so that's that's the presentation uh view for the other screen so you do see there's there's the um the one that looks like a magnifying glass can you move your your mouse yeah, over there so right the there. one next to it nope go to the one next to it the one to the right to the, to the right uh one more is black or unblack yeah, what's slideshow? the next one Okay, now Bottle go to the dot, 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 dot one then. Yeah. See the dot, dot, dot one? Click on that one. Okay. And then there should be a... Hide presenter yeah, view. Yeah, there we go. Hide presenter okay. view. Okay. Yep, there you go. Quicker than me. 
Oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. There we You're go. on my You're tech team. You're hired. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Okay. okay. All right. So from, from the ground up, sustainable Northwest wood is really about um, all local wood species and, and our purpose is for the greater good. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that, but essentially we want to help people build with purpose. And one of the, the things that I noted um, is when I first started working here three years ago, very shortly after was one of the last times I saw you all in person. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was a gathering of, of the guild here at our shop. Um, and we had um, Dave Barman with Epilogue spoke and you guys had a great meeting here and it was just a blast. And it was a really great way for me to kick off my career here for sure. Cause I was like, yeah, we can throw a party. That was really fun. Um, and, and one of your mottos that really kind of struck me was you were promoting the craft of woodworking for the woodworkers of today and tomorrow. And, and we kind of take that view of making sure that, uh, that we're supporting ecolog ecological stewardship so that you'll have wood for those woodworkers of today and tomorrow. And I think that there's a, a real nice synchronistic relationship between what we do and what you do. And, and hopefully um, we can find some really creative and cool ways to do that together. And that is um, part of our overall goal is to, you know, to make a positive impact. And, and our work is only fulfilled by, you know, customers like you coming into our shop and, and the thing we can actually do to, together to make a positive impact because your purchases and how you decide to spend your money and where you spend your money can really have an impact one way or another on our community and on our forests and on, you know, mm -hmm. other, other places that you that you touch um, throughout our region. And I just take a moment to <laughs> introduce my team. We're just a very small team here in Southeast Portland. If you haven't been to our shop, we're at the, we're at the corner of 14th and Clinton. Um, and we're all a bunch of wood geeks, wood enthusiasts, uh, wood lovers. Um, we, there's some woodworkers on our team and I'm definitely not, even though I grew up with one, I, I don't have very many skills. <laughs> Uh, but I have a deep appreciation for craftsmanship and, and pretty much anything made out of wood. And I um, just ad admire the, the natural beauty of things. And, and then also just uh, the, the different places that it comes from and the types of trees that grow out here in the Northwest, especially, are really different than what I grew up with in Kentucky, for sure. And so that's, all, that's been a real interesting learning curve for me to learn different species and different attributes and, and uh, the different kinds of construction methods that can be used to, to utilize all that. We uh, come from uh, a nonprofit organization, actually started our company and uh, Sustainable Northwest is the nonprofit um, that's been around for 25 years, doing great work in the community and in the region when it comes to um, forest practices and water conservation and restoration work throughout the region. It's a really great organization and our president, Ryan Temple started there and really saw a need with um, the, especially in some of the restoration work um, to develop a wood place that these mills could sell their products. And so our profits go partially in support of Sustainable Northwest to support and continue their good work in our region. So when you buy lumber here, um, part of the money that, that we make goes to supporting those small mills in the area and lots of fabricators around the region. And then also to support this great nonprofit that's our parent company. So it really creates a win-win situation for everybody. Sustainability is at our core. It's really in our DNA um, and it's everything we do um, has a sustainability story. And I'll talk about some of the different ways that, that we define that and different things that, that we're doing to make the most out of the precious resource that is timber here in, in Oregon and Washington and a little bit out of Northern California. But we primarily focus our efforts here in Oregon to support some of the rural sawmills and fabricators right here, you know, within a couple hours drive of our shop. 
And our, our main goal is to bolster our local economies, um, to ensure the long-term health of our forests that we live and love to play in and, and to receive you know, those um, great products that come out of the forest. And then also to connect people to those places where wood comes from and to have people have, you know, just a sense of story and a sense of belonging and a sense of connection. One of my favorite things that we do is partnering with some of these saw, sawmills around the area, you know, with my background of growing up in a tiny little town in Eastern Kentucky, um, there are several sawmills in the area that are in tiny little towns. And um, this guy here in the middle is Kendall Derby. He's a juniper sawyer down in Fossil, Oregon. If you've never been there, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. And, and Kendall is the salt of the earth and one of the pioneers of um, harvesting and um, manufacturing with juniper and, and running his sawmill using that particular lumber. And we have worked with him and about a dozen different sawmills over in Eastern Oregon to develop different products that we can use um, out of that lumber that's coming out of restoration work. Mm. And so it's kind of a neat thing that we do with connecting, you know, the sawmills to the fabricators and then right on down the line to, to bring these products that are all just made here, grown here and, and produced right here in our area. Our stories tell different ideas and carry um, thoughts of, you know, all the different places and local people. Um, we specialize in forest stewardship council certified lumber. So FSC lumber, um, FSC is a third party certification that helps cons consumers to know that th th this particular product comes from well-managed forests. And it helps to provide a balance in our ecosystems and um, does FSC primarily focuses on selective harvesting and longer crop rotations so that the trees are um, there longer to capture carbon and also restricts the use of herbicides to kill everything around the trees and, and then um, wider stream buffers where logging is allowed. So it's, it's a great um, peace of mind certification and assurance that, um, that the lumber is from well-managed forests. And juniper is one of our flagship products here and it is coming from restoration work in Eastern Oregon. If you're familiar with that area at all, um, juniper, you'll see it all over the hillsides. Um, it's kind of taking over a lot of the grassland areas in, in Eastern Oregon. And because it's such a thirsty tree um, the, and water is pretty precious in that part of the state, um, it, the removal of juniper is really helping out the, to balance the ecosystems. Um, juniper became um, invasive as, as they're called. It's, it's just encroaching out of its normal territory, mainly because of fire suppression is not allowing those um, small juniper seedlings to be killed out by fire. And so it's just kind of running rampant over there. And so we do cool things like take that restoration lumber and then turn it into decking and furniture lumber and flooring and exterior siding and all kinds of different products. And we're trying to be really innovative with how we use it and, and to utilize as much of it as we can. It's a great resource and it's providing jobs in areas that there aren't very many um, economic um, opportunities. And, and it, while it's also providing habitat restoration um, and, and improving the water situation over there too. So it's kind of a, a cool program that we're doing and, and a great beneficial uh, wood um, that's incredibly rot resistant. It'll outlast cedar and redwood and then it's just supporting our local economy. So it's a, it's a pretty neat story and I, I love to tell it. Another thing that we do in that realm of um, utilizing resources um, is through salvage lumber. Um, there's a little mountain pine beetle that is decimating our pine trees out here in this area. It started in um, Colorado and it's kind of progressively moving this way. And it, um, the, the little beetle leaves behind this really cool blue stain 
that um, can be used in wall paneling and flooring and um, butcher block countertops and all kinds of cool uses for that lumber. And it's just a striking and incredible artistic pattern that, um, that comes through because of that little bug that kills the trees. So that's a, a, a neat little salvage story. Um, and a lot of what we offer comes from those kind of conservation projects and, and removal of, of diseased and dead trees. And then we also offer products that um, are coming from uh, other types of salvage, like urban salvage. Sometimes we uh, work with urban sawyers that have to take trees out because they've become too big for the space or they've become diseased or need to be taken out. Or like we had this winter, all of the, the snowstorms did a horrific damage all up and down the I-5 corridor. And there's a lot of trees that are they're being salvaged from, from those storms and we're trying to utilize and turn into lumber as much of, of that as we can as well. And some of our lumber comes from chipyards and also from other forest activity where they're discarding the madrone trees when they're looking for dug fir and harvesting those trees. And so we work with a couple of mills that will, will salvage trees like that too. We don't do any of the milling or cutting um, or processing or kiln drying or anything like that here, but we have a whole network of, of people that do. And so um, quite often we'll get calls for people that have an oak tree in their yard that they're looking for, you know, a special place for it so it doesn't turn into firewood. And we can usually connect people with urban sawyers in the area to help them take care of things like that. So just a little bit about FSC, if you're not familiar with um, the Forest Stewardship Council, um, they're doing really great work globally. Um, and then right here in the Pacific Northwest with um, certifying our forests, certifying the mills that cut the lumber, um, the fabricators that process it, and then the stores that sell it. And so there's a whole chain of custody that just uh, goes back to that assurance that the lumber itself is coming from sustainably managed forests. And, uh, and it gives the end consumer that, um, that stamp um, of, of assurance. And, um, and it's definitely something that we really focus hard on and know that the more FSC lumber that is purchased, the more demand that creates for sustainable lumber as a whole. So anytime you get a chance to do some framing lumber or plywood or things like that and, and can buy it from FSC forests, it, it helps everything you know across our region with carbon storage. It helps protect water and wildlife. And there's a lot of restoration work that's happening um, in FSC forests that helps to reduce wildfire. They will take some of those thin, thin trees and turn it into usable lumber as well. And then globally, um, FSC is helping de uh, to combat deforestation by protecting um, tropical forests as well. So, you know, here in the U.S. as well as abroad. So it's a pretty cool outfit. Hey, uh, Lynn, would you like to take questions as we go? Because I'm doing questions on a chat on the side. Well, you know, I, I am totally happy to take questions as we go. And this might be a good time, you know, just to touch on that if there is one now, for sure. Ask well, we've got a, a question. Uh, the photos of that uh, of that juniper. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like there's a, a, both a sapwood and, uh, and the heartwoods uh, darker and the sapwoods uh, 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 lighter. Is mm -hmm. there a uh, difference in rot, rot, rot resistance between the two or is it just all the same? That's a great question and it really is the heartwood is more rot resistant. So when you, especially if you use this as a landscaping material, mm -hmm. um, you can use it for retaining walls or for garden boxes. And, and when you're here at our yard um, shopping, you're going to want to look for uh, pieces that have more of that heartwood. The sapwood will tend to deteriorate a little more quickly, but they're bro both pretty dang rot resistant, but you will definitely get a little more rot resistance um, out of the, the heartwood than the sapwood. And, and, and I, have, I have a second question. And, and um, before moving to Oregon, I lived in Ohio, so I know Kentucky well. Um, oh. And... Um, out there, and, and we, we, we had two uh, scourges coming, the uh, emerald ash borer, which was killing all the ash, mm -hmm. and the gypsy moth, which was uh, killing oak. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 
I, when I came out here and saw that this this uh, pine beetle was uh, was destroying the pines out here, um, by culling the dead trees, are you slowing the progress of the beetle, or is is the beetle going to be like it? I mean, in in Ohio, they've lost the battle to uh, the emerald ash borer. They're they're going to lose every ash tree in Ohio. Yeah, that's really sad. And so. You know, I, that's a really good question. I, I'm honestly not sure if the removal of these trees is going to help because what happens is when the, the tree is dead and standing, the beetles will do their magic and then they will move on to another live tree is sure. my understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, yeah, it is. Um, and because of how rapidly it has spread from the rocky area, from you know the Rocky Mountains um, to here, and just the millions of acres that have been decimated over the last decade, um, I would say it's going to be a continuing problem. Um, there's there's a lot of blue pine on the market right now. It's priced you know super reasonably compared to other woods because there is an abundance of it. And uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any end in sight, unfortunately. And right. I mean, the cool thing is, is at least it does produce some really cool lumber, but yeah. there's a lot of it that is just absolute waste. You know, the beetles get into the wood and the, the buggy blue pine is one of the other nicknames that it has. And there's some pretty intense um, damage to the wood itself on the inside of the log. And so quite a bit of it is just waste. So um, yeah, it's an ongoing problem and it's kind of um, a double-edged sword in that the beetles sometimes will infest right after a, a wildfire, but they also create a situation where, where fires are much more prevalent because the trees are dead. So um, it, it's happening in both situations with them. And it'll be interesting to see um, if there's an increase in the population after this last series of really intense wildfires that we had this last fall. Yeah. Uh, actually, one of my members, Carol, has just replied that uh, removing the dead trees doesn't slow the beetles, unfortunately. Uh, to do that, live forests need to be managed to make them healthier and uh, more able to withstand the beetles because they go mm -hmm. for the trees that are stressed. So mm -hmm. thank you, Carol. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and, those, and, and as, you know, the climate is warming, the trees are becoming more stressed, it's harder for them to, you know, to thrive in those situations. And especially in forests like this one, particularly, it's pretty overcrowded, hasn't been thinned in a while, um, you know, and so when you can um, create a healthy environment for the trees, it'll make them more resistant, for sure. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's an ongoing problem. Okay, thank you. No other yeah. questions are showing up yet. All right. Well, you I'll keep, keep interrupting you, though. If yeah, I yeah please do. Please All do. Right. That, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, so the, to, to carry on, I mean, what we're doing here is we are stewarding a community that's connected by what we call Goodwood. You know, and Goodwood is coming from that variety of resources that we talked about. And it is uh, it, it's sustaining a, a variety of people from the lumberjacks that cut the trees to the sawmill owners. Um, construction is booming right now and contractors are thriving in this little community that, that we've built, um, you know, but there's also the truck drivers and the fabricators and craftspeople all over the, the region, um, you know, and just a wide variety of people that benefit from, from these connections. And we, we thrive ourselves, you know, on it and, and love to connect people in different ways that might be, you know, either looking for a contract or a referral or looking for someone to build a piece of furniture for them. And we refer to the, the, to the guild quite often for that and send people your way when they're looking for somebody to build something for them. And, and it's just a neat little community that we have of wood geeks and wood lovers and just aficionados that, uh, that really appreciate um, the, the mindfulness that our lumber is, you know, being, harvested and, and brought here to us. And it just makes for a really neat partnership with a lot of different individuals, designers and architects and, and, uh, and other retail partners as well. So we sell some of our lumber to um, Dunn Lumber up in Seattle, carries our Juniper products, um, contract furnishing mark, carries our butcher block countertops, you know, and some of the different uh, places along the way. So it, it's a really neat network of people that care. And, and I love that part of my job, um, getting to, um, to 
connect with different people coming from different backgrounds and stories. And what we really love to do is, you know, to provide um, wood that is worthy of your values and whatever your values are, if you're shopping local, you know, if you want to shop for responsibly sourced materials, environmentally friendly, um, you know, if, if your idea is simply just creative expression, we have different products to kind of fit any of those values. Um, and, and so, you know, moving from FSC certified framing lumber, plywood, pressure treated and fire treated lumber, um, exterior products like siding and decking and fencing, garden box material and interior products like butcher block, flooring, paneling trim, and then beautiful live edge slabs. Um, and then our assortment of hardwood lumbers, which I'll really go into a little bit more detail about. But there's, there's, if you are building something, we have a, a, a wood product that you can source sustainably and feel good about uh, what you're buying and, and how you're impacting the community directly. Hey, I have another question here. And this is, is are, are these, are the woods like juniper and blue pine milled to, to a thickness that's suitable for bowl or hollow form turning. So we have some turners in our guild. That are oh interested. yeah, you guys have turners and that's probably the one area that we don't do very well. Um, we uh, The thickest material that we get is typically a 10 quarter and with juniper and blue pine, it's usually eight quarter or two inch thick material. Um, sometimes we'll get live edge slabs that are a little bit thicker, but hardly ever any, you know, three or four inch blocks uh, of wood. But I bet a blue pine bowl or a juniper bowl would be absolutely amazing. And I don't know if you noticed I'm wearing juniper earrings today. No, so I did not you can do that. all kinds of fun things, right. um, you know, with the wood for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And we do stock it in a kiln dried, mm -hmm. uh, a quarter that's, um, especially juniper is designed for furniture. And, it, you know, we have a landscaping grade and then we have a furniture grade in that material too. Okay. Uh, do you, do your uh, COVID protocols uh, allow for spontaneous drop-ins or do you have to make an appointment? You know, we love it if you make an appointment, but it's not necessary now. The, the further we get down this path to where we're opening up, uh, we still have our front door closed to walk in traffic, but all you have to do is just call us when you get here and we'll guide you in. Um, showroom, uh, we'll, we're allowing four people in here at once, but the Juniper Yard and the open air warehouse are, you know, we can have more people in those more open air spaces. And, and it's usually really easy to just get you in right away. So an appointment's not necessary, but you can always call us and, and plan ahead, especially if there's something particular that you're looking for. We can um, organize the units of lumber. Sometimes there'll be plenty lumber in the rack, but if there's something specific like um, certain thickness or widths, or like if you need 200 board feet of four quarter colored madrone, we can have a unit set down for you. And that way you can sort through it and find the pieces that'll be perfect for your project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's another really good question too. Any other ones before we jump in? Yep, that's uh, the last questions? one that's showing up on the chat. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'll keep interrupting when uh, as, as a as I can, okay? That's great, Joe. Thank you so much. You're, you're awesome. You're a great MC. <laughs> so um, I would talk a little bit about our unique woods here to the Northwest. Uh, we stock a dozen different wood species um, and they're all coming from Oregon, primarily a little bit in Southwest Washington. Um, our white fur comes from the Collins Company down in Northern California. Their headquarters is actually in, in Wilsonville. So, um, and they're milled to standard dimensions, usually four quarter, five quarter, six quarter, and eight quarter dimensions. Um, some exceptions to those rules, uh, but we can also do custom cuts quite often too, especially when it comes to juniper, where we have a dozen mills that we work with. In that particular wood species, um, there's a lot of flexibility in what we can have the mills cut for us. Um, and then, you know, just a wide variety of, of beautiful woods. And so it, it creates all kinds of design possibilities and, and different things that you can create. And what I thought would be a neat way to organize this, since there's not really a great way to organize this, was just to start with the softer 
woods. I'm not going to cover very much about pine and cedar and the white fir. They're, they're a little bit out of the furniture making realm. Um, with the exception of sugar pine and ponderosa pine, we stock that in like a, a one by 12 that um, we've got a, a couple neat um, record uh, album turntable uh, storage companies that that make little uh, units out of that sugar pine but primarily I'll focus on these other nine species here at the top and I'm going to start with Doug fir uh, it's the softest of the woods that we offer and I'll work my way up to the hardest species as we go along the Doug fir being our state tree it, and it is the most abundant of all of the the tree species that we have here in our area and it's an icon of the Pacific Northwest. You'll see up here that it, you know, it, it grows primarily in the West Coast. This is like everybody on the East Coast that wants Doug fir. This is where it's coming from. And um, it, ours is um, certified by FSC to ensure that it's coming from sustainably managed forests. And in those FSC forests, you're really gonna find a diversity of species. You'll find a mix of big leaf maple and, and usually Western red cedar. There's usually some incense cedar um, and, you know, and just a mix of things that can be found in the forest. There'll be some madrone occasionally, and then just a whole understory of of other flora and, and fauna that live in the forest. And it just makes for a great place for recreating and wildlife um, habitat as well. And, and you can, if you ever have the chance to visit a forest that's managed like this versus a monocrop uh, where they clear cut and they spray and there's not another living thing around except a forest of really tight packed dug fir you can feel even the energy and the difference in, in how those forests act and, and behave and just, you know, what can, can actually even live there. So it's, it's a neat way to do foresting and it, the crop rotations are longer. So the trees grow much bigger and they'll do selective thinning to make room for those bigger trees. And, and the end you know, result is to protect our old growth and to make sure that some of these jewels are, are available for our future generations. And primarily Doug fir, we stock it for flooring material and, and trim for around window and door casings. We can have it custom milled if you've got something special that you're trying to match. Um, the flooring that we stock is um, the historic three and a quarter inch uh, VG or mixed grain. And then we also have it available in eight quarter for making furniture and just some really beautiful, clean, clear, um, beautiful pieces of lumber to make furniture out of. And I thought this piece in the middle was particularly interesting. That's actually out of a, a reclaimed piece of Doug fir that an artist at the Nature Conservancy built that little table. I thought that was just a really cool use of that wood. So it's Janka rating on the hardness scale is at 660. And so it makes for a pretty soft lumber, um, but there's all kinds of cool things that you can do with it. And then we'll talk a little bit about campground blue pine. And, and Joe, I appreciate you sending me a photo of your awesome little bench there oh, thank um, to, you. to share with the group. And thanks for letting me use that in my presentation. Uh, and thanks for just coming down here and shopping, you know, and, and finding what you need here and just, you know, creating that relationship for us. It, it, it makes my life a lot more interesting for sure. sure. And there's, um, you know, you can see that pine trees grow all over this region. Um, blue pine comes from either ponderosa pine or sugar pine. Um, the, the beetle doesn't seem to be too discerning about which pine trees are, they're, they're pretty much attacking all of them. Um, and, and what it leaves behind is a fungus, which is an inert fungus, um, but th that's what causes the, the blue staining in the sapwood. And you will see bug trail and, you know, pockets where um, the, these little guys have laid their eggs and hatched and all kinds of different um, patterns in the wood created by that blue fungus that makes just a very neat artistic expression through Mother Nature. These other two pieces were made by the guys at our shop. Um, Jake um, made this little 
um, piece for his dad for Christmas um, at, that, who's from Idaho originally. And, um, and it's a piece of butcher block that he uh, carved into uh, the state of Idaho. And just, you can do all kinds of things with this material, you know, from furniture to flooring and interior wall paneling is a really popular thing that we do with this too. And um, live edge um, slabs, we've got some beautiful pieces in, in the shop right now with that natural edge to it as well. Um, I have a question for you, Lynn, and that is, um, uh, I think you said earlier you did not have kilns. Is that, did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. We don't actually do or make any of this stuff. Okay. We, we buy it from people kind of ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it's, but this in particular is super important to have kiln dried uh, because there's a little bug that lives in the trees. That bug can also be uh, transported into the lumber. And so um, that, that's one of the reasons for kiln drying any lumber, but also to stabilize it and get it down to a moisture content that you can work with it easily. Sure. So we, we don't have a kiln or a mill service here at all, but work with um, several in the area that do. Okay. So it's, it's nice to have friends that do things that you can't, right? <laughs> so you have kiln dryers that you work with all the time then yeah but. we do yeah casters mill down in um milano is one and then there's there's several mills around the area and then kendall derby that first guy I showed you uh, in juniper country he is the only um sawmill um of the dozen juniper mills that we work with that has a kiln so um, most of the the lumber that is cut in eastern oregon is sent to his shop to be kiln dried, anything that we would want for furniture grade, but the the landscape grade is not kiln dried at all. We just use that green. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And to go back to that note on on juniper, you know, we I did talk a little bit about you know just the explosion of the the population of, of juniper in the last hundred years um, has gone from about a million acres of juniper in eastern Oregon, and you can kind of see primarily that is you know its natural territory. Well, because it has um, encroached uh, into the grassland areas, there's about 10 million acres of juniper right now. Um, in that area um, just because of fire suppression. And, and it makes it very challenging for the watersheds and for wildlife. There's some, some species that thrive on the sage grass that grows. And when juniper takes over the grassland, no sage can grow there. And so the, the sage grouse is one, one animal that has been put on the threatened species list. And, and removing juniper is helping to restore that habitat where that amazing little bird lives. And it also is providing grasses um, for, um, for elk and deer to feed in the winter. And um, the removal of juniper is actually pretty instantly gratifying. Just about a month after they cut it away from the stream beds, water returns to the little creeks. And so it's really encouraging to see um, pretty instant um, return of the grasses within about a month or so. Um, and then so, you know, wildlife and humans alike are benefiting from the removal um, and then also just from the end use of the, some of the really cool lumber that comes out of those trees. And so um, we're uh, working with a, a lot of different companies. The Fish and Wildlife Service is involved in um, creating some contracts for um, loggers and sawyers to, um, to cut and process this lumber and to remove it to, um, to help restore some of the watersheds that feed directly into the John Day River and the little tributary streams that have mostly dried up. Um, and it, you know, and it's really helping to improve the salmon habitat in that area too. So there's lots of cool projects around, you know, from making picnic tables and furniture um, and to little pieces of, uh, you know, little planters that uh, Liz built, made these little guys out of just some scraps um, and just a really unique coloring to the wood and, and just an amazing durability when it's used um, for exteriors and then incredible beauty when you use it indoors. Um, I do have a question. It's, it's six by six and eight by eight. These are beams. Uh, uh, and they, how long are they? 
Uh, typically eight and 10 foot lengths. Juniper doesn't get really tall. Um, you know, some of these trees are pretty massive, but uh, we do make eight by eights, mostly for landscaping lumber. And the six by six is the same thing. And they're a full dimension, six by six or eight by eight. All of these are full dimension to start out with. And um, most people will use them for retaining walls or for garden boxes. And, um, and sometimes like, you know, benches and things like that. So yeah, a, a wide variety of uses and typically eight and 10 foot lengths. And we can special order 12 foot lengths if you are needing something a little bit longer, but that pretty much maxes it out for what you can get as usable yeah. lumber out of these trees. And what's, uh, uh, we have, I have two questions about price. One is, the, do you have a price list on your webpage? And, and, the, and the second question is kind of uh, more specific is what's the approximate price per board foot of juniper? Oh, yeah, really good questions. Um, in a roundabout way, about $2 a board foot. Um, and there is a price list on our website. And, but it's a retail price list. And I will offer up to you guys that we give the, the guild special pricing. So at, uh, if you email us and there'll be uh, at the very last slide, there's an info at snwwood.com. We can email you our contractor price list, which will give you that guild discount. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I just put your, uh, your link to your uh, homepage uh, up on, um, up on the Perfect. Yeah. And to give you an idea of the retail price, uh, there's a little button right there in the middle of the homepage. It says click here for Juniper price list and that'll get you. Um, and the flooring um, or decking, how, how, uh, how, how thick is that and how long is it? is it? Yeah. So the decking is made out of a two by six. And it um, so by the time it's surfaced into decking material, it's a nominal dimension of an inch and a half thick. And okay. five and a half inches wide. And we primarily stock it in eight feet lengths, eight foot lengths. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a few 10 footers on hand right now. That's a little unusual, um, but eights and tens, mostly to the eights. Okay, thank you. And it is really absolutely beautiful as a decking material. Um, it, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, really pretty and, and incredibly rot resistant, which makes it, mm -hmm. uh, makes well, it nice. I have a need for some 12 footers. <laughs> yep. Yeah, if you have a little time to wait, we can talk. It usually okay. four to six weeks for special orders. Okay. Um, and that will probably add a little bit of time by the time it's kiln dried and then surfaced. So, yeah. And then I got one more question. What type of cut makes the veining shown in the plant holders that you have here? You know, we'll have to talk to Liz Blaylock. She is the maker of these and she literally found these as little chunks of scraps that were stickers to go in between the pieces of wood. Let me show you another piece that she made. So she's very clever. She hardly ever pays for wood. She finds scraps and things. And I don't know if you can see, am I sharing my screen still? Can you see me? Um, let's see. So she, but she, um, she finds these little scraps and nuggets of, of cool pieces of wood and then turns them into all kinds of little air plant holders and things. And so you will find um, a wide variety of swirling wild grain pattern in every piece of juniper. Every stick of that wood looks different than the one next to it. And I tell people that every day, but until I did an actual fence project of my own, I didn't realize it's really varied from piece to piece. <laughs> so you, yeah. you'll find all kinds of neat um, swirls and, and grain patterns. And Liz got lucky with a couple of those pieces and then she just honed them to their to the beauty that exists right there. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions on Juniper before? Not, uh, not no, 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 I've, I've, I've got them all. Okay. All right, all right. I'll go. Yeah, it's my so favorite. Whenever, whenever you switch slides, I'll, I'll pop in. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, great. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, here's the one question that just came in. How, um, how stable is Juniper? I mean, how much does it shrink or expand? I think that's what. Uh, Commandante means? Yeah, well, you know, with any wood, um, as it takes on and releases moisture, as the conditions change, it will take on humidity and release it just, just like most typical lumber. Um, and the kiln dried product is definitely more stable than, than others. 
Um, even when it's kiln dried though, juniper, because of that crazy grain pattern that it has, sometimes it can bend and twist and bow, even under the best of circumstances. Um, when we're having the mills cut um, the larger timbers, we try to always make sure that they cut them right on the heart center. And that helps to keep the boards nice and straight. Um, and when you're getting into dimensional lumber like this, Primarily, it, it will stay straight as long as it's stacked nice and flat, but when customers go through the units and start, you know, moving things around, then it kind of loosens things up and, and Juniper gets to express its personality pretty much in any way that it wants to yeah. until it's fastened down. And But once you fasten and join and, you know, and screw it into place and, and do what, it, what needs to happen, then it, then it tends to behave pretty well. Okay. And it does it, how does it compare with that? Uh cedar for external projects or yeah it, it's about twice as rot resistant as, as the newer growth cedar we have access to right now so a stick of juniper should last about 30 years in direct contact with the ground Yikes. and in okay. eastern oregon it probably lasts longer like 50 years i mean some of the ranchers over there will use juniper posts and oh, yes. they, 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 they last indefinitely in that drier climate um, here where it's a little soggier and the, you know, the west side of the, the Cascades, um, we're conservatively saying about 30 years, whereas cedar, you, you're lucky if you're getting 10 to 15 years out of it anymore. The old growth cedar probably uh, is pretty well on par. Um, and some of the, the advantages and disadvantages, if however you want to look at it, just the kind of the pros and cons, um, juniper is longer lasting, but it has some limitations in what kind of sizes we can do or would be recommended because of the swirling grain pattern that it has. Cedar tends to be, um, you know, grown for its lumber. And so it'll, the trees will be taller and straighter and, you know, have been notched and, and their limbs cut off, you know, so the tree can grow, grow large without, you know, all the branches and juniper is just this wild squirrely little tree that has never had any pruning, you know, so um, the lumber that comes out of it looks kind of similar when you look at them side by side, especially if, after they've weathered out and silvered um, from the weather, they'll look pretty similar, but um, overall cedar's more uniform um, and a little bit softer, quite, quite a bit softer, in fact. Um, and so, you know, just some differences. You can get longer lengths in cedar that are just not available in, in juniper. And, uh, and just overall, cedar tends to be just a little bit more, more well-behaved. Let's put it like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So moving from some of those softer woods into the hardwoods, I'm going to start with the softest of the hardwoods, which is our Western big leaf maple and definitely appropriately named. It's one of my very favorite trees in the fall with the amazing golden color that, that kind of pops throughout the forest. Um, I, I'm fortunate enough to live next to about 20 acres of woodlands behind me with a lot of big leaf maple and dove fir and, and Western red cedar right there at my back door. And, um, and it's just um, a lovely tree to look at and, and produces some of the most commercially significant of all the hardwoods that we offer here in, in the West Coast. And it's a really beautiful kind of creamy um, tones to salmon kind of tones. And occasionally we'll find some pieces that develop this really amazing figuring. Um, there'll be some quilting or, you know, just some water colory looking grain patterns that, that pop up in, in big leaf maple from time to time. And nobody really knows why. And if there's somebody out there in your group that is a real wood nerd and has some theories or some, um, you know, some scientific evidence of why that figuring shows up, I would love to know. Um, but it, it's really utilized in making flooring and furniture and stairs and, you know, a, a variety of different, different things. We've got some beautiful live edge slab, 10 quarter maple in the showroom right now that came from Xena Forest. Um, we work with a, a several mills around the area. Western Hardwoods supplies quite a bit of our maple for us. And uh, we make butcher block countertops out of it. 
um, and chopping blocks too. We've got some gorgeous maple in grain um, cutting boards in stock that we just got back uh, from some scraps of stuff that we had laying around that we had made bigger um, butcher blocks out of and had a lot of those staves left over. And so we had our fabricator make those into some in grain cutting boards. So we're trying to always like use and reuse. And if we find that we have some extra material left over or some waste that's happening, we're trying to capture that waste stream and make something more creative and productive out of it until we can't. <laughs> and so you'll see that, you know, big leaf maple here, it grows all along the West Coast. And, uh, and it's definitely our most abundant hardwood and commercially significant one that we have out here. Um, epilogue, who I think uh, you, many of you saw speak the last time we all gathered together here. Um, this is one of the, the big leaf maple trees that they saved from an urban street tree and then turned into some beautiful um, material for making furniture and live edge slabs. It's on the soft end of the, of the hardwood scale at a Janka rating of 850. So it's not nearly as hard as uh, Eastern maple, but it sure is beautiful and, and lots of cool things can be made out of it. One of my favorites is this piece down here at the bottom by uh, Black Rose Woodcraft. Sean is a really amazing maker and he did some really cool ebonizing technique that I'm not exactly sure how the heck he did that, but I think it's a, a really neat um, play with with maple and I just love seeing how creative people can get with such a, a simple wood. We stock this one in four quarter, five quarter, six quarter and eight quarter and then we have a few of those ten quarter maple slabs in stock right now. Oh wait, wait. okay. Um, yeah you want is Never mind I got uh, somebody had asked what the Janko uh, rating uh, was for Juniper and and one of our people wrote back and said 660. So yeah, 660, you got it. Yeah, so that makes juniper a really uh, hard softwood is kind of how we, we refer to it. It's super dense too. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and, and not very much softer than, than maple. And um, our maple, I should mention too, is all FSC certified. So a lot of our lumber, especially in the hardwood category, is um, coming from salvaged opportunities. And this one is coming from well-managed forests. And this is a salvaged uh, log material that we get um, in the way of Oregon walnut. We call it Willamette Valley walnut because primarily there's a lot of um, walnut orchards in the valley where the, these trees are, have come to maturity. And, and so when we're able to get our hands on it, that's typically where it's coming from. Right now we have some absolutely some of the most beautiful walnut I've ever seen um, come through our shop that came from the Umqua Valley. And there's an old sawyer in that area that um, had harvested a huge walnut tree um, and turned it into a bunch of live edge slabs and then some premium four quarter and five quarter lumber. So we've got a really nice selection of some gorgeous Umqua Valley walnut in our shop right now. If you are um, a walnut lover, that's my dad's favorite lumber. And, um, and he's made several pieces of furniture um, out of walnut over the years. And it's really interesting to me to see how different the, our eastern walnut is from there versus our western walnut here. And I think, I mean, there's probably a little difference in the species, but, but also just in the minerals that we have in our soil really create a lot of different coloring and, and grain patterns in this wood. You'll see little tints of green and almond and chocolate and espresso and, you know, and then this rich kind of red um, mahogany color underneath there too. So a real wide variety of color in our walnut here. It makes beautiful furniture and cabinetry, flooring and, and wall paneling and then butcher block countertops and, and all kinds of things. This little guy right here is the edge of my desk that my laptop is sitting on right now. And it's an absolutely stunning piece of furniture by Bench Dog Designs. And um, Operation Woodshop made this really neat walnut top with those great little butterflies. And then he used Oregon white oak for the legs in this piece. 
Beautiful. So it, the the one thing about walnut, it's not native to Oregon. Um, the settlers brought it over here, and that's why we're seeing quite a few of these trees coming available right now is because they only live to be about 150 years old. So a lot of these that the settlers brought over are coming to the end of their, their life. And you'll see them in people's trees in, in their yards sometimes. And, and so we've salvaged quite a few from urban street tree situations too. And uh, it has a Janka rating of 1010. So it's a, it's a very hard wood, not as hard as oak, um, but quite a bit harder than um, maple. And um, it just has just lovely character to it. We typically stock it in all these different dimensions of four quarter, five quarter, six quarter and eight quarter. And then out of that beautiful tree, uh, we had nine huge live edge slabs. They're like 45 inches wide and nine feet long. And there's one left out, out of that tree. They went pretty quick, but they're, amazing and um, conference tables can be made out of things like that and it's just a, a gorgeous wood indeed and an Oregon myrtle is one of my personal favorites uh, it's a really unique tree first of all it's an evergreen broadleaf um, and it kind of reproduces or grows by sprouting other little trees all along its root system. So one myrtle tree can can get huge, but it always usually has a bunch of little myrtles um, living right there along with it. And it has a pretty exclusive territory. It just grows along the west coast and then a little pocket here in the center of California. So primarily most of our or, um, myrtle is coming from southern Oregon and northern California in this little pocket right there. And we have a really cool sawmill down in Southern Oregon that we work with uh, that salvages most of these trees from chipyards. And so it is amazing to me that these would end up as mulch somewhere instead of some of this amazing furniture and musical instruments and things that people make with it. It's um, got a really nice kind of buttery yellow to chocolate brown and there can be tints of green and um, espresso and all kinds of different coloring in that wood and um, and I, I love how it expresses itself sometimes with some figuring and just some really neat grain patterns and it is a Janka rating of 1270 so it is a pretty dang hard wood but it's easy to work with it cuts real nicely and um, and is um, joyful to work with to hear most of my sawyers and most of these um, makers talk about it. John with Stumptown Reclaimed is this guy here and he specializes in tables and uh, and he always manages to to find some really unique pieces to make some beautiful furniture with. And we also do flooring out of it and butcher block countertops too. So it's it's a really versatile and again, you know, we pretty much can make any of those products out of any of the lumber that we offer, but for butcher block especially it's a really it's one of my, my faves because of that grain pattern and coloring that it offers. And tan oak is a little tree that I did not even, I'd never heard of it. Um, I, I didn't know what the lumber looked like. And it's, um, it's a really unique, again, uh, evergreen hardwood. So I think that's one of the things that's pretty unique to this area is that our hardwood trees are evergreens. And I, I, that was not something I had experienced growing up in Kentucky. All of ours are deciduous and lose their leaves in the winter. So, and tan oak is one of those that is, um, it has some characteristics of oak, looks to me a little like red oak um, to a degree. Um, and then, but it also has chestnut qualities too. So it's got a little bit of both of those kind of grain patterns and uh, it makes beautiful butcher block countertops and flooring and, furniture and um, and is a, is quite hard at a Janka 1420 and we typically stock this in four quarter five quarter six quarter and eight quarter material and I have never seen a tan oak tree out in the world so uh, it's kind of like my goal is to hit the west coast and you know line and see if I can locate some tan oak trees because I just think they they look like they would be really cool 
And I wanted to go back um, for just a moment um, on the different sizes of lumber, you know, the different thicknesses. Myrtle is only offered um, in sizes up to six quarter because of a little powder post beetle that cannot, the larva is not killed uh, in the kiln if you go in dimensions of, of above six quarter. And so we, we try to keep it just a little bit thinner to make sure the kiln does its work because that's a pretty nasty little pest that we don't want um, creeping out of people's furniture at some point down the road. So that's worth noting, especially if you run across some myrtle, um, you know, at a roadside sale or on Craigslist or something like that to just be mindful and be aware that um, kiln drying doesn't necessarily kill all the larva when you go to some of the thicker dimensions that you might find it in. Good to know. Good mm -hmm. to know. All right, there's tan oak and then madrone. It's like at any given moment, every one of these species could be my favorite, but madrone is consistently my favorite. Um, it is, it's one of my favorite trees. I can't even actually believe that we can make lumber out of these trees. You can kind of see they, they're very twisty gnarly, beautiful red barked um, trees that it, it doesn't seem possible that you could make straight lumber out of it. But we get some beautiful pieces from this mill um, in Southern Oregon, same mill that processes our myrtle for us and finds those in chipyards sometimes. But primarily he works with a network of dug fir loggers that will just cut madrone trees out of the way. They don't want to mess with all this squirreliness when they have those nice straight dug fir to harvest. And, uh, and they'll just uh, let, let John know that, uh, that there's some, they're, they're in a stand of madrone and he can send his guys up there to, to salvage some of those trees out of the forest. Otherwise they go you know, into becoming nurse logs and such, I guess, for, for other um, forest activity. But we're fortunate enough that he saves a few of those trees and turns them into some really beautiful lumber. And Madrone has amazing character. There's a richness um, and a splash of that red heartwood that shows up um, in, in quite a few of the pieces that makes for really interesting furniture, butcher block countertops, flooring, um, lots of different uses for that lumber as well. And this guy right here um, is a maker up in Tacoma, um, Dan DeShanes with Tom Foolery. And he made all of these beautiful pieces here across the middle of the screen. Is a real neat kind of Danish modern kind of look and feel with his own unique twist. And, and he really loves uh, Madrone and, and, and makes, makes the best of it. You know, just really utilizes that unique grain pattern and uh, that, that is so sought after. Um, it's very hard. Um, it is a Janka of 1460 and it is a super tight grain. So it makes for a natural um, antimicrobial kind of surface. So it's really ideal for cutting boards because of that. And uh, it's one of those neat little tidbits that I didn't actually realize about this lumber, but it's, it's very cool and, and used a lot in um, in the food industry um, to make cutting boards out of. Uh, what kind of lengths can you get of that, of Madrone? You know, right now we have up to 12 foot lengths, typically eights and tens, but occasionally they'll get in a stand of longer trees that they can do some 12 foot material. All of our lumber comes in random widths and mostly random lengths. So there could be some shortcuts, but um, primarily eights, tens, and then a few twelves every now and then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We also get this in live edge slabs from time to time too, if you guys are into that kind of thing. And Oregon white oak. And yeah, and again, here I go. Okay, I'm on this one. Now this one's my favorite. And so, uh, and it's hard, you know, because they're each one so unique and beautiful in their own way. Um, I recently, and I should have put this on here, but I recently had um, an amazing piece of furniture made by Nathan Denahanian um, as part of my bathroom remodel. He made my bathroom vanity out of some Oregon white oak that we got from um, Storm Blowdown um, from Elkton Reserves. And, and it's just an absolutely amazing piece of furniture. It's beautiful lumber. 
I grew up with my dad making me pieces of red oak furniture straight from the 80s. You know, I, I've got some like vintage 80s pieces in my house right now that I will never give up. Um, but there's something unique about our Oregon white oak um, and just the, the grain pattern and the coloring. Um, I love that more golden kind of hue that our uh, white oak has. And, and just, it's just lovely to work with and, uh, and beautiful end result. The joinery um, uses um, quite a bit of Oregon white oak and uh, dirt rust and sawdust, if you know those guys too. Um, so some beautiful doors that, that, um, that he made um, out of our white oak. Operation Woodshop did those legs and that's that little walnut table that he shared some photos with me. And, and then there's several companies around town that have Oregon White Oak installed in their conference areas and reception desks and things like that. And it, it's really becoming a very popular wood, especially with architects and designers. And, um, and what, what we find, and one of the things that we try to do is, is to educate people on, on the usable lumber. Um, designers and architects are infamous and, and maybe furniture makers are too but uh but infamous for asking for riff sawn lumber um or quarter song you know and so when you're when you have a whole log and you're only using a tiny little portion of it to get that special little flick you know that you're looking for um it, it's leaving the whole rest of the tree and so we primarily stock plain sawn There'll be some rift, there'll be some quarter sawn in there, but we don't sort for it. And, and the reason we don't is there's so much beautiful lumber in the overall tree. And oak especially, this Oregon white oak is, has become alarmingly um, endangered in, in the Willamette Valley because it, it grows in the same type of soil that grapes love. And so a lot of the original habitat that covered the Willamette Valley in oak has been converted to vineyards, uh, and to hazelnut orchards, and to other agri agricultural plots. And what, what people usually do is they just go in and they clear the whole land. And um, so there's only, um, you know, 5% or less of that original habitat of our oak um, surviving in the Willamette Valley right now. And so we are working with the Oak Accord to help restore 20,000 acres of oak habitat in the valley. And we work real closely with Ben at Xena Forest and he operates the largest uh, contiguous plot of, of habitat for Oregon white oak. And he selectively harvests and does a really nice job with his forest. And it's a family owned forest that he's really taken care of. And um, he's a great partner and, and, and a role model for, you know, for what can be done. And uh, some of the work that the Oak Accord is doing is helping landowners um, understand the value of oak as, as a viable hardwood source. And if you let it grow and then harvest it selectively that you, it's, it's a viable income. Um, it, it's also home to a, a lot of creatures that don't like to live anywhere else besides an oak habitat. So um, there's, there's definitely value all the way around um, in providing habitat for, for animals as well as humans. And, and that, vineyards can actually thrive when they leave a little patch of oak on their property. And so um, the Oak Accord is doing some outreach to try to get more people to sign up, to be part of the Accord, to commit to saving part of their oak habitat on their properties and, uh, and to, to help restore some of that uh, so that, that we'll still have oak for future generations. Thank you. Um, I got a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, do you sell uh, cut lengths or just whole boards? Primarily whole boards, um, and but there's always the opportunity to find really close to what you're looking for because we usually get every wood in in random widths. So if you're looking for a seven inch board, we're probably going to have one seven and a half, eight inches wide. If you're looking for specific lengths, most of our lumber is eight and ten foot lengths. 
but like with this particular batch of oak and pretty much all of the ones, there'll be some little cutoffs and, and pieces that will be shorter if you're looking for something smaller. But primarily we like to sell the board as it comes from the mill. Um, and then uh, because we don't really offer much in the way of cutting services, I mean, we can chop a, a piece of wood to help you get it in your car, um, but we like to sell the whole board as it comes from the mill. What other questions do you have about that? Gary, Gary, is this related to the Gary Oak of Southwest mm -hmm. Washington? Yeah, I think they're related, but it's a little bit different species. This is, um, oh, how can I say it? Uh, how do I say it? They're a variant. <laughs> <laughs> Quercus garyanus, Gary, is that right? Somebody else, somebody else without an Eastern Kentucky accent can probably help me out with that. Yeah. Quercus garyanus. garyanus, is that how you say it? Yeah, and this uh, white oak's probably garus uh, alba or something like that. Something like that. I should I should have the species. Next time I do this, I'll put the okay. the genus on there as well. That would oh, be helpful. And, and we do need to kind of uh, watch our time here. Because oh yeah. We, yeah. So. Yeah. So, and, 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 in watching our time, I mean, this is, um, this is kind of coming to the close. I think, you know, whatever you're building, we want to help you build with purpose and, and to, you know, to build with some sense of having a positive impact in our community and then the forest around us. You know, we all, we all love our Pacific Northwest forest and we want to see them thrive and we want to see our local communities thrive too. And there's absolutely a way to do both. Absolutely. That's yeah. what, and I think you're doing a great job of that. Uh, people had asked me uh, a couple questions. Uh, oh, uh, somebody said that the uh, Gary Oak and the uh, Oregon Oak are the same species. And uh, how do we get a contractor's list? of prices. Yeah, shoot us an email right there at info at SNW okay. Wood. Make sure to put two W's in there, one for Northwest and the other for Wood. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, and, uh, and just uh, tell us that you're with the Guild and that you would like um, our pro price list. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I know the answer to this one because I've done it, uh, but you do smell, sell small quantities, just like one, a single board if I oh, heck went yeah. in. Yeah. yeah, we sell a single board or a truckload. We, we're not picky. <laughs> okay, cool. And I love it when the guild members come down. It's always a treat. You guys are always working on interesting projects and are just, you know, enthusiastic about what we have to offer. Most of, most of you guys always feel like this is the candy store and you've come to heaven. So yeah, come on down. I'd love to show you around and introduce yourselves and and hopefully, like, you know, maybe toward the end of the year, we'll be able to have some some sense of a gathering in person. Um, everybody yeah. on our team is now at least one vaccine in. A um, couple of us are uh, fully vaccinated. So uh, we're, we're getting there. And, okay. uh, and I think we will, you know, be able to see each other uh, full face to face before too long. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, a question came through is, uh, does Tamara Rooney still work for you? You know, she left the company about two years ago. She's not here now. We still work with her husband, Brian, quite a bit for, um, you know, he, he's with Bench Dog Designs. And, and we see him from time to time um, for some butcher block installations. He does that from time to time. Gotcha. Yeah, and she, um, she gave me a flowering Chinese lantern that actually just bloomed yesterday. I was thinking about it just yesterday. Uh, hey, do you, uh, do you do delivery of large quantities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do delivery of large or small quantities. Actually, we can deliver um, anywhere in the Portland metro area. Delivery is free if your order is five hundred dollars or more, or we can do it for fifty bucks if it's less than that. Oh, okay, that's great. Um, um, uh, Gary uh, uh, Weber would like to uh, make a comment before uh, we sign off here. So, That'd Gary, I'll let you Hi, unmute Gary. yourself. Hi, Gary probably muted because i muted everybody yeah i'll bring you guys back up here too i'll stop that yeah. chair okay usually i'm not muted when i should be um <laughs> it's weird it's for all of us <laughs> i just you know i just wanted to share uh an experience i went in uh yesterday uh I, my wife wants a uh, sliding barn door for our laundry room and and we decided on 
on, uh, on blue pine. And so I went in yesterday and, and uh, uh, spent a little bit of time with Lynn. And, and uh, if you have not been there, I really, really encourage you to go. Um, they're wonderful people. It's, uh, it's a relatively small, um, and I don't say that in a negative way. It, it's, it's, um, it's not a big box store, you know? It's a relatively small uh, and very comfortable location where there's, you can take, check out the wood. Uh, the wood is wonderful. I saw yesterday, uh, and I mentioned this to Lynn when I was there, that I saw some of the most beautiful Madrone I'd ever seen in my life. Um, and so not only are they doing the right things, you know, doing for the right reasons, um, but the wood is, is unique. Um, it's easily accessible. You can go in, find what you're looking for. Uh, they're very easy to work with. Um, they are going to be from this point forward, they're going to be my number one source that I look for, uh, that I go to looking for wood. So, um, I, I encourage you. It's a, it's a wonderful experience. Um, um, when Lynn told me she was from Southeast Portland, I told her, well, she must be from the deep South east of Portland. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I, I just encourage you to go, if, if nothing more um, than to, to uh, for familiarization, go in, check it out, um, look around, get a feel for it. Um, it's, it's an incredible place and I, I can't say enough good things about it. Thank you so much. It was re yeah, really great to meet you yesterday. And your your checks in the mail that was like the best yeah, testimonial right, I could have ever have hoped for. <laughs> well, I would like to really thank you a lot. We've done questions as we go along, so I don't really don't have a. I don't know if we really need to do a, a Q and A at the end here because I've I I, I much prefer to do them as we go along because I think it <laughs> makes it more spontaneous, uh, more interesting, and. Um, uh, I would really like to thank you a lot. I too have been to your shop, as as you well know, because I've mm -hmm. you've seen some of the things I've built with the, your with the wood, uh, um, and uh, I've got a, uh, a a pavilion I'm going to be building in the back, so you'll hear from me soon again. Um, but I'd really like to thank you on behalf of the guild, and uh, we uh, uh, I couldn't I, I totally agree with Gary. Uh, you're doing good stuff. Keep it up. So thank you, thank yeah, you very we, much. We, we could not do what we do without you. So okay. thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll be in the shop tomorrow, planing, milling, opening the package of that, uh, yes. of that blue pine if somebody wants to see what it looks like. So um, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Lynn, for you know, yeah. maybe, uh, hey, Gary, maybe you could uh, uh, do a little thing on show and tell next week about uh, take some pictures. Uh, I might be able to do that. Let me check my calendar, Joe. I'm pretty pretty dang busy, you know. Oh, I know you are, right, sir. Yeah. Aren't we all? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, send me your pictures. I would love to see your photos. You can send them to that same email address at info or to me at Lynn at SMW okay. Wood. Yeah. I'll it, try to. I'll, people always want to be inspired, and you are the most inspiring group that we work with. So, yeah, send them, send them my way. Will do. And, and I'd like to close by asking uh, people if they find the, what, what kinds of uh, things do they find most interesting for these kinds of presentation. And you can just email me directly at joe.wheaton at uh, the uh, Guild of Oregon Woodworkers.org. And uh, so if you found this presentation interesting, let, let me know and, uh, and give me some feedback on uh, uh, what other kinds of things you'd like to see. And with that, I'm ready to go. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Thank all you, so Lynn. much for your time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lynn. Good night, folks. That's it. Night-night. <laughs>